Good morning, Springfield Faith Center, and welcome to the Without Walls podcast. And I'm very excited today because we have a special guest with us who we will introduce in just a second. My name is Daniel. I'm the associate pastor here, and I'm joined, as usual, by... My name is Brandon. I'm the senior lead pastor here yep. at Springfield Faith Center. We have an exciting guest today, and so we will let her introduce herself, but yeah. go for it. Uh, my name is Sue Crandall. Some of you may know me, many of you may not, but I spent the last 28 years in China. I've been home for almost a year now. Yeah. It's okay. So for me, it's actually it's genuinely weird having you here full time because my entire adult <laughs> life here at part as part of this church, I'm just used to Sue comes for visits. She comes to say hi and hang out for a couple of weeks and then she goes back to China. And so it's, I mean, it's exciting. I love having you here and I love having you as like a regular part of the church, but it's just a very new thought for me. I'm sure it is for you too. <laughs> it's a very strange thought to uh, <laughs> yes, be here every Sunday and know that the next Sunday is coming up and yeah. I can be here and again. You get to stay. Yeah. Yes. And this has been normal for me because Sue's been here since I've been here basically. And so I've seen her all the time, which is awesome. So I don't know what it's like to miss Sue. So which I'll probably experience that soon. Hopefully I know you someday. want to get back there someday. So yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's cool. uh start off like we always do with the Beyond Sunday segment where we take the sermon from the day before, the week before, and we go beyond that to see how it applies to our lives. And mm -hmm. Daniel, you had the, the opportunity of preaching this last weekend. I did, had fun with it, yeah. So yeah, well, it's, uh, I guess I can answer the first question. And Sue, if you want to chime in, you can as well. But the first question I, uh, we usually ask is, what stood out to you? I got my handy dandy notes here. I was doing camera, and what stood out to me is you made a comment about the cameraman <laughs> not being on point. And, no. And the camera wasn't responding to my zoom in and out. Oh, and was I, it? No. And so I was like, so I had to turn it to another camera real quick oh. and adjust it. But anyway, and that's my, stood out to I me. did not mean that as a slight <laughs> against. I'm kidding. <laughs> Good. I'm glad. Um, I, I really liked, obviously, the, the passage calls for a focus on prayer. Mm -hmm. um, but I think for me, what stood out is one of the questions, um, or basically, it was like, how can I be more devoted? And um, you talked about the idea of a dedicated time of prayer. And I think for me, it's I usually have been legalistic about it. Like, oh, yeah. oh, I have to have this much time, this much uh, every single day, or I'm not a real Christian. And you'll get some of the people who talk to you about, oh, you, do you spend 15 minutes the very first thing you wake up? I'm like, oh, right. usually the first thing I do when I wake up is is not that because my rhythm isn't, isn't right. like that. Right. And I felt like I was... At some point, um, or in some respect, I was a bad Christian. So right. I let like the legalism oh, yeah. rather than the, the devotion. Mm -hmm. And so I think for me, the the what stood out was like it's really the devotion that mm -hmm. matters, and and like the yearning to spend time in prayer, and then doing it obviously, right. but not like having to fit someone else's formula or mm -hmm. someone else's model. Um, for me, it, it's really what works for me and my rhythms and how I connect with God. And, and so, but I, but then there's another, get to it a little bit later, but the yeah. challenge of, of how can I be more devoted? Right. And that's a tough balance, you know, that element of, of legalism. And cause that's something that a lot, I think a lot of people have struggled with. Even this last week, as I was getting ready for the message, I had, I had that quote from EM Bounds that I used and that I read that, that whole book, it's a short little book. And the whole book felt like it was riding on that edge between encouragement to passion for prayer and legalism in mm. commanding it. And the book was was filled with a lot of good stuff. But the whole time reading it, there was a part of me that kept like almost flinching or wincing as I read certain parts because it just it felt so close to that legalistic uh, approach. There was one section that I read that I did not enjoy where he was talking about, he was talking about how preachers, um, should the, the, what he said, and I have no idea if this is something he practiced for himself, but what he said was he preachers for every hour, uh, they spent in study preparing for a message. They should be spending two hours in prayer for it. And I thought I have never once done that in my entire mm. life. And, you know, and it was one of those moments where I was just like, I think I'm feeling judged right now and I don't like reading this and I have no idea if what he's expressing is actually healthy, but it's not making me feel good right now and I don't know what to do with it. So, 
That's yeah. pretty intense. It's super intense. Because if, you, if intense. you're spending, you know, sometimes I'll spend 10 hours. Yeah, 10, 15 know, hours. Yeah, doing yeah. studying and writing and thinking and dwelling and contemplating what I'm about to say. That means, yeah, I'd have to do <laughs> 20 hours of right. prayer. Wow. Exactly. N.T. Wright has said something similar to that when he was talking about um, him preaching a lot. He would always make sure he spends so much more time in prayer before he ever does any preaching right. and that can conviction there too. And me. I have to hope that for those guys, it's coming out of a place of deep health, you yeah, know, but, sure. uh, it does seem it was as, even as I was reading the book, I was like, man, this feels heavy. This doesn't feel like mm-hmm. light and like I'm being called to something I can, you know, be excited about. This feels heavy. And I think that's part of the balance for mm-hmm. people in that is that we don't want a devotion to prayer life to feel heavy. We want it to feel life-giving and like you're connecting to God. And yeah, of course, there are going to be days where you wake up and you're just like, I can't do this or whatever. <laughs> but um, but we don't want it to feel like that all the time. I don't think, anyway. That's Yeah, I went through a period of my life where I actually set a timer mm-hmm. and I had to pray for that amount of time. So I, I um, <laughs> it lasted for a season and then I, I moved on. But yeah. one thing that, that you said that really touched me, that is not a major point, but sure. when Eli asked you, mm-hmm. um, are you praying for that yourself? Yeah. yeah. And for me, it was the opposite of, you know, there's sometimes when all I can pray is, oh God. Mm-hmm. And so I'm really glad in those times mm-hmm. that there is someone out there who can carry the burden because... Sometimes life is just too overwhelming. Absolutely. So it, that, you know, it's kind of the flip side of what you were right. talking about, but right. it was what touched me. Well, and especially for you, and I'm sure you'll talk a little bit more about this later coming out of your experience, that there's a degree, you've dealt with a degree of separation, you know, not having a regular church family for so much of, of your career. And, uh, and I, I assume that there's a degree to which you've had to sort of deal with that sense of separation and loneliness, especially when it comes to prayer. So, Definitely. Anyway, yeah. yeah. Mm. Good stuff here. I think one of the next question we ask, and and we do get comments and people send us messages um, <laughs> like telling us what stood out. And if you can comment on our threads as we post them, that's great. If not, we'd love to hear kind of what's standing out to you from our messages. Um, we have one more uh, week in in the book of Colossians, yep, and so done. it's been a it's been a fun study, at least on this end. I, I've enjoyed I, it. I've enjoyed it too. Got yes. A lot of good <laughs> feedback. Um, so yeah, if you're out there, and if you're if you're what stood out to you, it's a good question to ask yourself, and maybe talk with someone else about it as well. The second question is, what challenged you? Mm-hmm. And so um, for me, um, I was looking at the idea of having flavored speech. I think you were saying like you're um, the speech that brings life. Yeah. And I think especially um, nowadays since, since everything that's happened with, with COVID and um, kind of with race relations last summer, we had an election. Now we're going into, you know, COVID part two and vaccines and all this stuff. Like there's a lot of people um, who don't um, speak life. And I have to look at myself and I have to say is, is all of my speech seasoned with salt right. to bring, to bring life? Is it flavorful? Is it adding to, to value of people? Um, is it pointing to Christ or pointing to Brandon or right. pointing to something else? Right. Um, so I think that was the thing that was challenging me is, is we hear a lot of things that usually strike fear or strike helplessness or despair. And like Christians should be setting the the tone. And for me, myself, I should do it and everything in my power to, to speak with, uh, with grace yeah. and everything salted and salty speech. You're saying the best of terms. <laughs> um, and so in, in, I don't know, it's, it's, it's something that I think for us, I, I love the verse where it says, be, be quick to listen, slow to speak right. and slow to become angry. And I would love it if it said, and then when you do speak, make sure you're speaking, right. You know, with grace and with, and, you know, salted speech. And so that, that was a really big challenge to me, um, that, you know, I, I, especially as a, as the, the, the senior pastor here, um, you know, what I say, I think sometimes can be, can have a lot of weight. And so I want to be someone who's always Definitely. pausing to speak yeah. with grace and light and, and speak life to people and, yeah. um, not get caught up in the, there's always that temptation to get caught up in like the death spewing or right. like, you know, just hates hating and, and saying evil or, or, or just saying things just so you feel better. Or I feel better kind of a thing. And, right. and so that was a big conviction because well, I think what Paul's getting at here is like, you know, when you have the opportunity to share, yeah. if you haven't been salting your speech with grace, you know, in life, like no one's going to listen. Right. 
And so I, I, yeah, it was a huge conviction and challenge to me of, of to pause and mm-hmm. to think, okay, so what, what's about to come out? Is that going to be, is that going to be grace filled? Is it going to be life giving? Right. So, yeah. And for me, and I'll draw in sort of the third question, cause where we typically go is, you know, what would you have talked more about this? Mm-hmm. And, and for me, this is what I would have talked more about this idea of how we, how we speak and what it's communicating to people. I've been doing a lot of my devotions recently in first Corinthians and all throughout first Corinthians, Paul's message to the church there is build each other up. Build each other up, build each other up, build each other up, build each other up. You guys are, you're zealous for the spiritual gifts, you're zealous for the things of God, but the way that you're implementing them and practicing them is tearing people down right now. You're, you're, you're hungry for the things of God, but you're not employing them constructively in the way that you interact with each other. And his message is constantly be building each other up, be building each other up, you know, let your interactions with each other be constructive, let them be helpful, let them be life giving. And for me, it's so much of the same tenor, so much of the same theme of what you were just saying, Brandon, that this idea that the way we interact, the way that we talk to each other needs to be salted with the grace of God. That needs to be what's coming through. In yeah. Um, when I, when I was in China, there were two places I went that I really had to pray before I went to mm. just so that I wouldn't say something that was not going to come out. Well, the bank and the post office, something bad always happened there. Interesting. And so I would just pray all the way over that I would not just spew forth <laughs> what I was thinking because I had enough Chinese that I could say something. Be, not be grumpy. Nice. And <laughs> <laughs> but, and then even here in America now learning what the new rules are, how to oh, say yeah. what, how do you describe things even because right. the rules have changed. Mm-hmm. And so I've really learned to just be quiet. Yeah. Uh, mm. To listen. I listen so much more than I used to. Yeah. Um, because I don't know what's okay to say. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Good for you. That's a, that's. I need to learn that. <laughs> Besides uh, adding more talk about that, what, mm-hmm. is there anything else you would have added? Or I mean, there is obviously a big portion of the message was about prayer, and there is so much we could say about prayer. There's so much more we could talk about. There's so much more. I mean, the church history, Christian history, is so rich with examples of people who had powerful prayer lives, and looking at their stories and how they experienced prayer, what it meant to them to connect to God, to communicate with God, to receive from God. There's a lot of benefit that can come from studying the lives of saints in our generation, people who've been doing it for a long time, but even the ones who've gone before us and are past now. And just looking back throughout the course of church history, there are so many examples. Um, I, you know, this last week I read articles from Catholic nuns, from Catholic friars, from people in the Eastern Orthodox Church, Mm -hmm. people from, you know, the Wesleyan tradition and all over the place, just seeing the richness of what it means to connect to God in life and to receive from him and how people have experienced that. And there are beautiful examples all over the place. And, uh, yeah, so I think that's probably what I would have talked more about is just is is real life examples of what it looks like and how people can engage with prayer and how they can employ it in life. And because prayer is really one of those things that doesn't I don't think there's a box for it necessarily. I think Jesus as we talked about gives us a really good grounding as a place to start, but one of the things that I read consistently over and over and over again is that wherever we start with prayer, the promise of God is that he's going to grow it into something bigger than what we started with. He's going to grow it into something richer and more deep than than we started off thinking it was. So, good stuff, man. It's a good message. Thank you. It's always good to have a little, even though it wasn't like planned. You know, we're going to talk about prayer because it's in the text, though. <laughs> right. Like, it's always good to to remind, just a reminder, and also to challenge. You mm-hmm. know, challenge us in our devotion and and watchfulness. Well, and like you always say, and the same thing is true for me. And I and I would hope any preacher, like if it's only challenging for the body, cause it was challenging for me first, like God oh, yeah. spoke to me and said, all right, this is where we're going this week. This is what, this is what we're working on in your life right now. And, uh, yeah, those challenges are deeply necessary. So, 
Well, good stuff. That was a good Beyond Sunday segment. Sue, thank you so much for joining in and, and popping in your thoughts as well. It's awesome. We are going to transition, though, now to kind of our talk. One of the things um, we're doing this upcoming weekend is we're going to have a missions highlight. And so when I was talking with Sue, I said, Sue, since she's on the, our missions council here, serves on that, um, I said, how about you come on to the podcast um, and talk about you and your story? I don't know very much about your story because I'm new to this community and she said yes so that's why she's here today and so it's cool because then this Sunday when she does her talk I can say hey if you want to know more about Sue and her experience go check out our yeah. podcast that we just released last week so this is awesome but kind of basic questions um, first of all is like when did missions become important to you or maybe a way to think about it is describe the moment you knew God wanted you to go overseas as a missionary or just just spark that desire for missions yeah, I uh, I didn't get saved until I was like 27, mm, and okay. um, almost immediately I knew that overseas work was going to be part of my life. Mm. I didn't know what it was going to look like. I didn't know where I was going to go, um, but I just felt um, from the very beginning that I would someday be going somewhere. Um, so it had to be, even at that point, you know, the Holy Spirit was kind of a stranger to me, mm -hmm. but I think that he placed that in my heart very mm. early in my walk. Mm. Cool. Awesome. So you mentioned earlier that you went to, um, to China. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much you can share about that, but, um, like what, what caused or what, what was, what was it about China that, you know, drew you there or, you know, what, what experiences brought you to China? I would say, um, China chose me rather than me choosing okay. China. <laughs> um, Back at that time, there the assistant pastor here was Riley Taylor, uh -huh. and he and his wife went to China um, as English teachers for two years. And uh, I went to visit them, and uh, then uh, later on, I, a couple years later, I was going. And I think seeing um, where they lived, what they were doing, how they got there was um, something, well, that's something I can do, which God thankfully embraced, mm -hmm. um, rather than me hearing from God, um, you know, this is where you're going. I, uh, so during that interim, when I, I wanted to go, but God, my parents' health was very bad at that time. And uh -huh. God told me, you cannot go until they're gone. Okay. And I didn't know how long that would be. It, it turned out to be relatively short. Mm. But during that interim, I got to be a sender. Mm -hmm. And I think oftentimes people hear the word missions and they're like, no, yeah. I'm not going for, pick your reason, <laughs> snakes, food, whatever. <laughs> and, um, you know, sending and going are two sides of the same coin. Right. You know, you can go to 7-Eleven and buy a Coke with the same coin. Mm -hmm. So um, I was blessed to be a sender, and then I got to be a goer. Mm -hmm. It's all missions. Yeah. And if you think of it, because um, I was kind of struggling with this, and God, why can't I go now? And he just told me one day, he said, you know, I am the greatest sender of all time. Mm -hmm. My son is the greatest goer mm -hmm. of all time. Now you tell me, Sue, who is greater. Right. And I was wow. like, I got it. Okay. I'm happy to be a sender for that's now. That's awesome. Wow. That's, that's awesome. awesome. So you shared about Riley and Lindy a little bit and kind of how that was the beginning of your experience. What was it for you? Like, when did you end up going for the first time? And what capacity did you end up going to China in? My first time was a visit with Riley and Lindsay. We went okay. in 1987. Um, for two weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, Riley had taken two terms of Chinese at the U of O, so he really knew nothing. <laughs> um, and uh, we just went on a scouting expedition. Okay. And they went to China, 88 to 90, and uh, I went in 92. Okay. The fall of 92 as an English teacher. And that's when it started to become a full-time thing for Correct. you was in 92? Wow. Correct. And how much Chinese had you taken at that point? None. <laughs> 
<laughs> wow. Absolutely none. <laughs> I asked wow. a Chinese friend here how to say, where's the bathroom? Oh, my goodness. The problem with learning how to ask a question is you don't have the ability to understand the answer. The answer. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can say, where's the bathroom? But where, what they tell me is. It's your, yeah, you're going off of hand signals. And, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, exactly. Man. Yeah. How long did it take you to to learn uh, Mandarin and, and to be able to speak um, at a point where you felt conversationally you were able to, to know the answer when they say it back to you? <laughs> I am not a an English or uh, a language a person who learns language easily. Okay. So um, as an English teacher, I tried to study Chinese, but I just I just couldn't. Mm-hmm. I, I felt like my students deserve my time. Right. So um, I stopped teaching and um, started studying. So it wasn't until I'd studied for um, two or three years that I started feeling mm. fairly confident. And then over the years, I would teach sometimes and I would study sometimes. Okay. And then um, got to the point where, you know, most everyday conversations I... I don't have a problem with. Yeah. Nuclear physics, I'm not yeah. <laughs> <laughs> To be fair, most people struggle to discuss nuclear physics in English. Yes. So, and, yeah. uh, you know, 9-11 happened and mm. I learned the word for terrorism. Pretty quick. So sometimes yeah. you just learn words because right. you got to know them. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, same thing with, with COVID. Yeah. You learn a whole lot of yeah. language you never, never dreamed that you needed before. Yeah, absolutely. So you went and taught English. Um, what were some, and you kind of mentioned the language barrier, but what, what were some other challenges that you faced while you're over there? Just understanding the culture. What I've learned over the years is that language and culture are so intertwined yeah. that um, you really can't effectively learn them unless you learn both. Mm-hmm. And so just sometimes knowing what to do, you're, you just have no idea invited to somebody's house, what do you do? What's the mm. correct thing to do? Right. Um, and oftentimes you're invited to someone's house and they sit you in the living room with grandpa and maybe a three or four year old and everybody's else in the kitchen cooking. And so grandpa keeps peeling apples and oranges for you. And you know, there's this big meal coming up and, um, the TV's on. You don't understand the TV. The little kid can't really communicate. Grandpa's clueless. And so you just sit there staring at the wall. So the, the whole cultural aspect. I feel of, like this is coming out of a very personal experience here and a story that actually happened to you. Over. This is. Uh, yes. Yeah, so um, just trying to figure out what mm. to do. What's the correct thing to do in the correct situation. Yeah. Is. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, just an incredible challenge. And then navigating around a city Uh because here, well, I can read here, but Mm. in the beginning, I had to navigate by um, landmarks. You know, find the big tall building that's got blue windows and turn right Mm -hmm. because I couldn't read. Yeah. And so you you kind of feel like, um, you know, being illiterate is not fun. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Yeah. Not, Not at all. Yeah. So uh, when I started learning Chinese, I wanted to learn reading, writing, speaking, the mm-hmm. whole thing, because I didn't want to be illiterate anymore. Right. Yeah. Wow. So continue that, because you were talking about some of the barriers and the challenges. And of course, you went, you know, on the surface, at least, as an English teacher. Correct. But there was a degree to which you knew you were going for the purpose of, you know, the gospel and, and right. the church. So talk about that a little bit and some of the barriers there and how they manifested when it came to your, your walk with the Lord. Um, one of the biggest barriers, of course, was the language. Mm-hmm. Um, also, you have to be very cautious who you share with and how you share. But as an English teacher, you can share American culture. So the okay. holidays were when we could really share freely in the classroom. Interesting. Because so many of our holidays are based on, I don't know, Christianity. Important Christian dates and events, yeah. Exactly. So Christmas, uh, Thanksgiving, Easter was really fun. Of course, we would do the secular part. We'd color eggs and we'd do those things. But it was really a time where we could freely share. And then if students were interested we could get with them maybe one-on-one or two-on-one outside of class mm-hmm. and um, and share with them more deeply there. 
And my understanding is that it was almost exclusively in those more personal environments that you could really talk about elements of your faith more exactly. specifically. Exactly. In the classroom, you can um, you can say you're Christian, mm -hmm. but you can't elaborate on it. Okay. Uh, and if, if someone asks you, you can answer questions. Even in the classroom? In the classroom, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, an interesting thing about Chinese culture is it's rare that you are one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. the, the Chinese are a very um, uh, a, a culture where people do things in groups. Okay. And so usually if one student wanted to talk about it, they'd bring someone else. Okay. And you may or may not have known that they were... <laughs> bringing, bringing a plus one yeah, yeah exactly uh -huh. so um that was always interesting and uh one thing i did learn um early on is uh we don't understand we don't know the seeds that have been planted right mm -hmm. so riley and Lindsay had been sharing with this woman for a while when i went to china um i went to visit some of their students and i met her and we were having dinner together, and she said, I want to know Jesus. Mm. And I got the privilege of leading her to the Lord. Wow. Those seeds had been planted years before. Yeah. And then in another situation, I'd been sharing with a, uh, a Chinese guy for maybe a year. And one day, he went to some teammate's house, and they led him to the Lord. Mm. Isn't that cool? Yeah. That is so cool. So we can't make notches in our belt right? because the Holy Spirit does it and mm -hmm. we share and then we just give it over to him. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we, the fruit just comes into our hands and sometimes someone else's hands right. and we just get to rejoice yeah. because that's the important thing. Someone has come to the Lord. Wow. That's so cool. encouraging. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's almost like it's it's definitely it's the relational aspect and and having a you know having capacity in someone's life to share like either you've built trust or the seeds have been planted and they know that you know people are there and you can trust and they can come and and ask those questions of hey I want to know the Lord I think sometimes people um, at least here think that it. it some like the pastor's got to preach a sermon, so I got to right. bring my my friend in to hear a pastor preach, or hopefully the pastor doesn't mention too many negative things. But like I love how in you're saying in your experience, it's planting seeds, but it's also being in relationship and trust, and then you get the chance to to lead someone. Not it's not some big altar call, and those things happen, I'm sure, but not you know not to the extent of you know you get to have a the one on one moment and and they know you and they trust you. And, and so you can easily do that because it's, it's, it's built out of that, that relationship. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And one thing that, um, I really learned is you have to love them unconditionally. Mm -hmm. I have wonderful, wonderful Chinese friends who've never come to the Lord. Mm -hmm. They are as precious to me as those who have come to the Lord. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you just, uh, share your life. You have them in your home. You go to their home. And sometimes the big events in life, weddings, uh, childbirth, death, mm -hmm. are the times when people, you know, broke up with your boyfriend. <laughs> um, those are the times when you can often have real, you know, personal discussions with them. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, there's nothing more indicative that God exists than a newborn. Mm. And, you know, to be in the hospital with someone who just had a baby and look at that baby and you can just say to them, look at this child. I mean, it's perfect. It's got fingernails and eyelashes. Mm -hmm. That didn't happen by chance. Mm -hmm. You know, God, yeah. God created this little person mm. that you are now going to raise. So, uh, yeah, things like that are very, very precious. Cool. Mm -hmm. I love how you you get to be there for those life moments too, and and because you have that relationship, it like they again they trust you for that and want to open up. What are some of your like best memories? If you looking back, um, what are some of the if you had any cool stories you could share? Some of the best memories of whether it's related to working as the English teacher or related to you know bringing someone to the Lord or just just something fun you did. I don't know what's what's a really one of your best memories. I think. I would say all of my best memories are tied to people mm -hmm. and it's those relationships that you, you develop over time and to the point where you, you have a backstory with them 
so you can start telling jokes about something that happened two or three years ago. Yeah. And we get it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and one sp special thing was one of my Chinese friends actually came to America for a year, and she and her son came here to visit, and they, they came to church here one Sunday morning. And that was, uh, that was very special. That's so and, cool. And uh, that friend has, I've shared with her, people have shared with her and shared with her. And she said, I believe it's probably true, but I can't do it because of my family. Mm -hmm. I cannot become a Christian because mm. of my family. So uh, talk a little bit more about that. Because I, I, as an American sitting here, I understand that there is a barrier for Chinese nationals like that. Mm -hmm. But how can you explain that a little bit more for us? Help us understand, like, what does that barrier look like for them? Why is it so hard? Um, often it's... In, in this case, she's Tibetan Buddhist. Okay. And so uh, from birth, hmm. that's what her family does. That's part of who they are. It's not a decision you make. It's just you're raised that way. And so to um, turn your back on that, so to speak, then how do you relate to your family? Mm -hmm. And what will your family think about you? So it's it's really difficult for them to say goodbye to your family in a way, even mm -hmm. though she wouldn't do that, but they would know she's not going to the temple with them. She's not doing the things that they do. And the same thing, I work with a lot of uh, Muslims over there. Mm -hmm. The same thing. Um, I mean, for them, they can be kicked out of their families. Mm. And so it's just really, uh, it's heartbreaking. Yeah. To know that um, she believes, but she can't make a commitment. Right. And um, sharing with people and just knowing that uh, this is a bigger decision than it is for us here in America. And, I, and that's what I was just going to say. And I feel like one of the big distinctions culturally there here in America it is so much a part of our culture that individual choice mm -hmm. is the freedom of choice is so important to us culturally that we make room for that in families and in culture that if somebody makes a decision that's something that we place a lot of value and priority on so that even in the context of family if I make a decision that could theoretically alienate me from my family sometimes that does still happen mm -hmm. but a lot of times families are willing to agree to disagree. That's a common exactly. phrase here. And it sounds like that is not nearly as much a part of Chinese culture for them. It is not a part of Chinese culture at all. Mm. They are very group oriented. So if the group doesn't um, want to go that direction, you really can't make a left or a right turn. Mm. And so you, you pretty much are committed to where they're going. Isn't, isn't though too the, um, the culture of being like an honor and shame culture too? Definitely. Like, so if you, if you decide or you mm -hmm. believe and commit, then you, that you're shaming your family. Um, and so that's, or, and then they in turn shame you because you didn't, you dishonored them by, by walking away. We're here. It's, we're a guilty and innocent culture. I mean, right. It's written into, you know, the fabric of our law and judicial system is built yeah. on that. So like if we're here, it's like, well, I didn't commit a crime. So I'm, I'm not guilty, you know, right. but, but there is like, well, you, you know, you're, you shamed us, um, by, yeah. by turning your back. I never really realized the, the depth of, um, losing face mm. until I lived it over there because, mm -hmm. you know, here it just seems like, oh, well, sort of kind of, but they're losing face. That shame thing mm. is, I mean, it's at their very heart. Yeah. And so to cause someone to lose face, I mean, I had a, a teacher and she, her, her daughter, there was a new kid that just moved in and she said, well, go out and give that child face, it means hmm. go play with that child. Interesting. Mm. So you can give face and you can lose face mm. and you really don't want to shame your family at all. Um, it's difficult to get back in. Yeah. Um, not impossible, but it, it takes a lot of work. And yet, like the the underground churches in China are like thriving, and um, yeah, I hear stories and and read read stories of you know just the Christianity in China. It's nothing like here. In other words, you don't meet in big buildings. You meet underground, and you but you like the like the Chinese church is is 
thriving, even in the midst of persecution. And so there are people who are doing it, families who are doing it and turning. Right. And so there is there is hope that the gospel still breaks through some of those those barriers of honor and shame or, you know, giving face and those things. And, and so, I mean, you know, yeah, it would be shameful, but the gospel still moves and thrives. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. and God is still good. So, yes. And that's actually one of the things I was going to ask that I, I, you know, I've read these stories as well. Does that, for those people who are making this decision, who are accepting Jesus and, and experiencing Christianity, does the church then become sort of a new group for them, a new family? Like, is there a dynamic there that because they are so group oriented and community oriented, does that sort of fill the gap for them? What does that look like? It does to a certain extent. Okay. Yes. Because it, it, it becomes their new group. Mm -hmm. Um, it's still difficult though. Of course. Um, because if your, your birth family yeah. is, is kind of not happy with you, but yeah, it does. And, um, you know, there are various levels of church in China. There's the underground church that you mentioned. Um, there are home groups that are kind mm. of under the radar mm. and there is a, an official Chinese church. Um, and some of them are very good and some of them are very bad. Okay. So it just kind of depends okay. on who the leader is. Mm. And, um, although right now the government is becoming more and more strict. Mm -hmm. So it it's really is difficult. What was your experience with church life over there? Um, predominantly, uh, I met with a group of foreigners. Okay. Um, usually on Sundays, sometimes in the morning, sometimes in the, in the afternoon. Um, I did attend Chinese church occasionally. It was, uh, because of the language barrier, sure. it, it was not very life-giving, Okay, mm -hmm. but uh, it was interesting to see. Yeah. And their mm. worship style is very group-oriented. Mm. I mean, you don't go against it. I mean, here, everyone stand up and sing. Well, not everybody does, and right. people are okay with that, right? right. But there, <laughs> and, and you don't, I mean, you all clap together and right. then you stop <laughs> clapping together so it's a very different huh. it's not bad it's not wrong sure. right. it's, right. just, it's just different yeah. and so um i didn't find that very life <laughs> uh, so it, yeah it it is kind of mm. um kind of funny how long were church services for the, the chinese church um they were a couple hours okay yeah yeah that's yeah, always... we hear that out there we're, we're, yeah. we're running. <laughs> when daniel goes long we're actually going very very short that's right that's right that's, <laughs> that's exactly right that's, yes that's always an interesting question for me because that does vary culturally so mm -hmm. much when we were in africa church yeah. services were like four hours long so yeah, we were in Mexico. There were at least two hours, yeah, to, and, exactly. that, and a full meal after, and, mm -hmm. and yes. it was so the whole ordeal was usually three or four hours. Significant, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. You were yeah. committed to church, yeah. <laughs> right, right here, yeah. You know, I'll watch it online later. There you go. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. Hour and a half max, and uh -huh. right now, you know, an hour. Yeah. So Sue, so, so I know that even in discussing this, um, there are certain topics that we have to be careful of and certain things that we have to watch out for. But as, far, as much as you can share, what do you miss most from China? The people. Yeah. Mm. They're my family. They really did become my family. Um, there's, I mean, I was called auntie and, mm. and grandma. Oh, and, I love that. You know, just... Uh, if their holiday came up, I was expected to be there wow. and to be a part of it. And uh, so, yeah, I, for me, it comes down to the people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's uh, that's the most precious thing. And that's what I was there to do is to build relationships right. and share um, as best I could under the circumstances that I was yeah. in. So, yeah. And, you know, I would love to go and just hang out with my friends. Mm -hmm. mm. And that's one of the things I was going to say that I know that your hope moving forward into the future is to be able to return to the country sometimes to, to maintain those relationships and see those people. Exactly. So. Yes. Um, the virus has the upper hand right now, but right. God's not going to let the virus win in the long run. Amen. That's right. So. Amen. Yeah. Cool. So question, how can we, how can we be praying for you now and how can we be praying for, um, 
like your friends and the people in China who you miss and what are some prayer points we can we can give to our church congregation so that way they can be joining you in in that aspect I think for me is I'm continually trying to find my my niche here in America mm-hmm. what is what is the thing that gives me purpose and there are a few things that are happening but just you know what does God want me to do here in this place sure. right now um, and as far as uh, China, the government is really, really cracking down. They're ter- they're mm. tearing down not just Christians, but um, every religion. They're tearing down buildings and they're requiring the Chinese flag to be flown over the buildings and things like that. Mm. So just for um, the Christians to stay strong, be safe. And for the gospel to continue spreading mm-hmm. would probably be the biggest prayer for over there. Okay. Mm. So yeah. similar prayers for <laughs> around the world as far as go- gospel spreading, people being safe, especially yeah. right now. But yeah, we will we'll be definitely praying for for you and also for um, for China, and we'd love to see. Um, yeah, we love seeing on, I don't know if you guys noticed if you're out there listening on Sunday mornings, we've been putting up on our, um, on like our pre-service slides, some, some info, information about China. The, that was the, the country we were highlighting this week. Cause we, um, you know, have people who are serving there. Um, and, um, I don't know if I was supposed to say that, but in, in <laughs> we can edit it out. It's, if, it's if okay. Not. <laughs> um, so yeah, but we just uh, we we care about um, care about Sue. And we're so thankful for what she's doing here, serving mm-hmm. on our missions council, and kind of being one of the key leaders of that. And so, yeah. So if you're out there, please be praying for Sue. And and as she is transitioned back, I know sometimes transitioning is um, is not very easy. There's a lot of difficulties, and even just me transitioning from California up to Oregon yeah. has been it hasn't been as smooth as people would expect. But right. going from China to here back would, to the states. Back to the states is yeah. a lot more expounded. So I, I can relate uh, only a sliver of it. Mm. But um, So just be praying for her in that. And um, be if you're listening to it this week before Sunday, um, yeah, hopefully you can tune in this Sunday and hear some more admissions update from, yeah. uh, from Sue this weekend. So And yeah. Great. Thank Sue. you very much, guys. I was just going to say thank you for coming yeah, and joining thank us you. for answering it was awesome. questions. It was yeah. really yeah, great to have you. So, so Daniel, do you want to finish with uh, scripture reading? I would love to. All right, from Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 through 6. Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray for us as well, that God will open to us a door for the word, that we may declare the mystery of Christ, for which I am in prison, so that I may reveal it clearly as I should. Conduct yourselves wisely toward outsiders, making the most of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer everyone. Amen. Amen. All right, we'll see you next week.